This vaccine equity video series is produced by the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. Our series elevates promising and replicable practices for equitable vaccine distribution. Practices happening both here in California and across the nation. Our video series will showcase community-informed and equity-centered practices that specifically aim to reach disproportionately impacted low-income communities and communities of color. My name is Marley Williams, and I am the Health Equity and Justice Manager here at the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. And I'm Dana Sherrod, Birth Equity and Racial Justice Manager for the Alliance. The Public Health Alliance of Southern California is a coalition of the 10 health departments here in Southern California. Collectively, our members represent 60% of California's population. In this video, we are joined by Heather June Northover, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health Center for Health Equity Director, and Hector Ochoa, Director of Public Policy at Southern California Resource Services for Independent Living. In this video, Heather and Hector discuss their partnership for reaching individuals with disabilities in vaccine distribution and administration during COVID-19, as well as the specific recommendations they are developing to ensure accessibility in vaccine distribution for individuals with disabilities throughout Los Angeles County. Heather, could you tell us more about your recent partnership effort to reach individuals with disabilities in terms of vaccine distribution? And also, if you could just talk about the role of the health department and of your partner as well. Uh, I think communities with disabilities is often a community that we struggle to address uh, and serve well. And so that's why this partnership with Hector um, has been really fruitful for us. I think from the perspective of the public health department, we oftentimes get a lot of recommendations from community folks, which we welcome and encourage. Sometimes I think the challenge for us is how do we implement those recommendations? And we really do need the partnerships of folks that have the lived experience and have the most expertise because we don't know what we don't know, right? And if you don't have representation at the table, you're not gonna have the, that critical lens. And so really ensuring that we're partnering with folks that, are, that have lived experience, are working with folks with lived experience was really what we felt would be a fruitful partnership in doing better work and ensuring that we're being much more accessible in the way that we are communicating information, the way in which we are designing our mega vaccine pods. Could you talk a bit about some of the areas where you saw opportunities for the health department to actually provide better support and more accessibility to people with disabilities? Questions came up about whether uh, the websites are accessible for people who are blind or low vision to navigate the appointment websites. Here in California, the MyTurn website and the, the county DPH website, are they accessible to individuals that are blind specifically? We use screen readers to navigate. In talking to our board member, you know, we spent a good uh, 30 to 40 minutes on the MyTurn website as well as the county one, to which he expressed that though it may deemed accessible, uh, the flow in which it is designed is not. And they're having to do a lot more searching around than they should need to be. As an example, there is a phone number on, on the vaccine website specifically where people can call if they're having issues with the website. In order for the screen reader to pick up that phone number, it takes a long time. It should be reading it at the beginning and it's almost reading it towards the end. And so that's not very helpful in, the, in that sense. And I guess uh, a third area, uh, as Heather uh, pointed out, is just overall accessibility at the sites. One thing is to be compliant, another is to actually be able to maneuver really from where public transit begins all the way into the pod and out the other end or or back. Are the sidewalk, that path of travel to get to the pod accessible? Is the pod itself accessible? Is there an opportunity for people to use the restroom while they're there? Because some sites may, there might be a longer wait time than others. A lot of older folks or, or certain people with disabilities um, may need to use the restroom more frequently. Language access, sensory issues, you know, these are all things to be mindful of. And is the staff 
qualified and trained beyond just administering a vaccine to be able to help in all these different areas. Heather, could you talk a bit about how the county responded to some of these concerns that were raised by community and by Hector and how you started to address some of these issues? I will say for the accessibility on our website, I immediately raised his concern and gave the feedback to our comms team, which then immediately went into a meeting to discuss the concerns, some of the recommendations, and figure out a timeline on which it can be implemented. Some of the things were more easily implemented uh, quickly. Some of the things that are in still are still in the queue, but the fact that it was elevated and that people could act on it um, very quickly is really important. You mentioned accessibility of the website. Are there specific strategies that health departments should be thinking about in terms of revamping the website to ensure folks are able to access vaccine appointments and other vital resources? In terms of the website itself, government has a responsibility to ensure that their websites are compliant, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are. And I think a lot of entities rely on software to ensure compliance. It's my guess that the software only searches that the code is not broken, that that the code is correct, and not necessarily at the flow and use of the website, that the website actually get put through the ringer, so to speak, by actual uh, people who use assistive technology, in this case, the screen readers, to identify whether or not it is actually compliant. Because as of right now, the article that I saw, I think there's like 94 websites all for scheduling vaccine appointments that are not compliant. And this was pointed out by the executive director of the Lighthouse for the Blind in the Bay Area. Are there other considerations you all are looking at in terms of access, either in designing the registration process or reaching individuals with disabilities or other access barriers during vaccine administration? You know, we're finding that folks are having transportation issues either because they can't or do not drive. That is something that we're trying to work through. Currently, we have a partnership with Uber who has provided us with a number of codes that allows free Uber rides to and from vaccine clinics. Originally in that agreement, it didn't include our megapods, unfortunately. And so we will need to integrate that. Hector and his organization actually assisted our department in registering folks for vaccine appointments at one of our megapods. And they were kind enough to organize um, and provide their own transportation. But this is absolutely not something that we should continue to rely on agencies to provide. And it really is on the local health jurisdiction to figure out resources and ways in which we can support. What I'm really proud of our department is that we've really tried to intentionally resource folks to partner with us in in order to do that work. Historically, government has taken a much more, and even public health has taken a much more extractive approach to lived experience uh, recommendations. And I think we need to ensure that we are actually compensating folks um, for that knowledge and that expertise, which we are attempting to do. It is not perfect we're doing a little bit of a better job around that. And I think in this experience, we will continue to build on that and just make that work much more stronger and that intention much more stronger. I I do want to say how critical and how uh, important it's been for me and for SCRS to have an ally like Heather, you know, within the County Department of Public Health, especially at a time like this that we're living through with the pandemic, or the word has been said uh, multiple times, intentional. And, you know, it's one thing to talk equity, uh, but if you're not intentional about it, it kind of just gets thrown around. That's, you know, that's my opinion about that. I just, I, I get that sense from Heather. And so having strong allies, within government and within uh, the community, um, not necessarily the the disability community, but just the community as a whole. One of the reasons SCRS and and I specifically organize our annual disability pride parade event is for that purpose, is 
not only for the exposure, but to let the community know that we need their support. We need allies. Um, so much has happened for other communities because they've garnered the support of a much broader community. And the disability community does not have that, which means we're typically an afterthought in a lot of the decision-making processes that happen at, at all levels, not just government. And the second thing that I would say is, again, what Heather touched on is there needs to be more people with disabilities in power on city councils, in government, in these departments, such as public health, and there just isn't. Definitely uh, doing what, what can be done to bring the vaccine to people is probably the biggest uh, opportunity to get as many people with disabilities vaccinated. So Heather, I know that the working group developed some recommendations um, and that uh, those recommendations relate to both COVID-19 vaccine distribution, but also uh, general feedback about ways to support individuals with disabilities. What were some of those recommendations um, and how did you come to those recommendations or how did the working group come to those recommendations? So that's a great question. So initially we did a focus group with communities with disabilities to talk a little bit about their concerns or feelings around vaccine access for their communities. And then as a second step, we brought together a smaller group of folks to look through those focus group recommendations, as well as think through and mine their own lived experience and that of the folks that they're serving, as well as looking at what we were currently doing at our pods and reacting to where we were in terms of how we were considering folks with disabilities and bringing in that focus group experience. Um, they developed a set of recommendations in some key bucket areas, including you know, appointment and information access, um, vaccine site access, uh, and really under that thinking about communication and support um, transportation, right, which is a big issue for a lot of folks, not just people with disabilities, and then how to have support services and other accommodations. The bigger set of recommendations that I thought was really valuable was a general feedback really related to how we are incorporating or using a disability equity lens. Um, I think when we talk about being compliant uh, with uh, like assess accessibility, it's really, you know, thinking about ADA compliance. And the folks really pushed us to think about that is like a minimal threshold. Um, and so really shifting that lens and thinking about how are we developing and designing the site with these folks in mind? So it's like intentional design or sort of what we're now calling human-centered design versus just looking at sort of what the legal requirements are. Um, and then the other two things that I think was really valuable is there were a lot of folks that talked about being mindful of intersectionality, that folks with disabilities also intersect with people of color, people who are immigrants. Um, and so working on and accommodating for, for those identities also supports people with disabilities. And then the last thing is thinking about how we recruit and compensate folks um, who are disabled to really think about um, how we are building our on-site websites um, or our physical sites to really have that human-centered design. Um, and that's actually something that we are implementing as a result of these recommendations. So we're thinking, or we are in the process of developing a plan to hire folks with disabilities to do an evaluation of our online content um, and potentially right, our on-site vaccination pods. I know that you are already starting to implement some of these recommendations. How is the county responding to these recommendations? In what ways are you already starting to implement these recommendations? And what do you see as some of the future work around um, implementing these recommendations, both during COVID, but also beyond? 
we elevated the recommendations to our department leadership, as well as the folks that are in charge of supporting um, and troubleshooting and working in our vaccine pots. Um, And so they have been thinking intentionally about how to implement some of this, the, the recommendations already you know, they've confirmed that they're using speech to text and ASL visual interpretation services at all of the sites. Um, We've been able to share it out with other folks, including, as I mentioned, our Department of Health Services, as well as some other jurisdictions here locally in in Southern California. Um, And I think where I'm most proud is how we're investing in communities and thinking about how we are resourcing folks with lived experience to help support, redesign, um, and shape the way that we are engaging folks and designing our our vaccination pods and other points of dispensary. 